We're back. This is Dave Vellante, and we're here at the MIT Media Lab. I'm here with my current co-host, Charlie Sennett with the Global Post. Charlie, great to be working with you. And Joseph Nye is here. He is the University of Distinguished Service Professor at the Harvard Kennedy School. Joe, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So this is uh, an event that is, is up your recent, certainly recent alley, uh, the sort of gap in governance and, and cyberspace, the, the pace of cyberspace outgrowing really international relations ability to, to keep up and you gave a talk this morning sort of giving some, some parallels with uh, nuclear proliferation. So where are we in terms of, of cyberspace? Is it, I mean, we love sports analogies here in theCUBE, but is it, it's, we're past the first inning, but, uh, but we're, we're certainly not into the late stages of the game, yeah, are we? We're probably on the 10 yard line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ours. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and, uh, Basically, the, the analogy I like to use is uh, when, a, when the world finds a totally new technology, let's say nuclear in 1945, something that's transformative technology, it takes a long time to learn how to cope with it, both domestically but also even more difficult uh, internationally. So if you look back on nuclear, you know, Hiroshima is 1945, you don't get the first international agreement uh, the limit to test ban treaty until 1963, and the nuclear non-proliferation treaty in 1968. So basically you're talking two decades before we learn how to cooperate internationally. And the internet, some people say, well, it's, uh, it's an equally transformative technology, total different type of technology, big impact on, on people and how we organize ourselves. Um, but people say it's a, it's a totally different technology, and it is totally different. But what's the same is that when we cope with a new technology, how do we learn? I mean, how do we, how do we develop the habits of international cooperation? And if it took two decades to learn in the nuclear, then where are we with cyber? And if you think of cyber as basically taking off, so to speak, in uh, the late 90s, uh, after the World Wide Web uh, makes the internet commercially usable, uh, we, we see a curve of use in the late 90s just going up exponentially. So you can argue that in that sense, uh, cyber uh, is only uh, basically 20 years or so. And so we're, we're at about the same point that we were in nuclear. So when you look at the state of nuclear in terms of, let's say, what happened after the breakup of the, the USSR um, and the increased complexity yeah. Um, and, and, and threat matrix that now exists in the world. <laughs> um, it's scary to think about what's in store from the standpoint of cyberspace. Now, Charlie says, well, think about the positives, Dave, but, but still, I, want, I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, it, the, big, the big difference that I think is uh, uh, in nuclear, while we do worry about non-state actors, terrorists getting hold of nuclear weapons, it's a pretty complex technology for terrorists or individuals to access. Mm. Uh, cyber is not. I mean, cyber is basically any 12-year-old uh, with a computer. I mean, I'm thinking of my grandchildren. But uh, it, there are so many ways in which an individual can participate uh, at such low costs. You know, there's this great cartoon in the Yorker 20 years ago about uh, two dogs in front of a computer screen. And uh, one dog looks at the other and says, don't worry, on the internet nobody knows your dog. <laughs> Well, uh, basically, if the lights go out in New England, uh, we would know it probably wasn't a dog, but you wouldn't know whether it was a government or whether it was an individual hacker. So in that sense, the threat is, is perhaps maybe less horrific with, uh, with an individual incident, but certainly more potentially insidious. You know, the threat mm -hmm. is, is very real, and so real, in fact, that at Global Post, we, we've experienced a, an attack, mm -hmm. uh, if we can use that language. Um, uh, by the Syrian Electronic Army, mm -hmm. uh, which we think may have been directly connected to pretty aggressive coverage that we've done mm -hmm. inside Syria. It was a very brave and courageous reporting. The media is certainly part of, uh, of the equation here in the sense that the media um, can be vulnerable. The media can play a great role in helping us understand this uh, equation, the need for better governance. But one thing I was really struck by in your opening remarks was your comment that the language needs to be toned down. The rhetoric of cyber war, cyber attack, cyber threat. Um, certainly, we felt very much attacked. But but are we 
overdoing the language? Are we overbloating it? And what's the peril in doing that? I think that, that yes, we are overstating things. I mean, it, and the peril of that is that we wind up not thinking clearly. We, we hype the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the cyber attacks, I mean, if, if you talk about any effort to intrude into a, a system, you know, there are tens of thousands of cyber attacks every day, and it's uh, uh, more than that. And, uh, you know, as long as we realize that an attack isn't like being uh, mugged in the street. Uh, some of them are, some are more worse, some are much less. It's like knocking on a door to see anybody's there. Mm -hmm. um, so the word cyber attack covers a vast multitude of uh, actions. Cyber war, which has been bandied about, um, I think it, it, we should restrict it to only things where uh, there's the equivalent of a kinetic or real world physical effects that we would call war in the real world. Otherwise, you wind up with cyber wars like the war between the sexes or the war on poverty or mm -hmm. so forth. And, and once you use a term that broadly, uh, you devalue it because it covers everything and therefore you can't make useful distinctions. Um, Joe, you've always been someone who uh, has helped us frame major issues, coining phrases like soft power mm -hmm. and hard power and helping us really think through how we're going to think about the future of warfare. Um, how, how, how concerned are you about the vulnerability of the United States uh, to cyber threats? And are we really entering a new phase of, of the way we need to think through the security for our country? Well, I think there are real problems. I, d I don't mean to belittle it, but I do think that uh, uh, exaggerating them doesn't make us think clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been estimates, I mean, these are off the top of the head estimates, that about 80% of the uh, threats that are faced could be cleaned up by uh, better cyber hygiene. I mean, by basically this low-hanging fruit, uh, we could we get rid of a lot of the things that are, are uh, nuisances, uh, creating frameworks for botnets and so forth, um, by better cyber hygiene. And that would allow us to focus on the things that are really more important. I mean, one is the loss of intellectual property through cyber espionage. Uh, that's, a, I think, a real and costly issue in our society. Cyber crime is also uh, very costly to our society. There are a variety of estimates of how much it costs each year, but none of them are low. And, uh, and then there is the prospect of, uh, of cyber war. In other words, if you imagine you did get into a conflict with another country and they decided they wanted to uh, use cyber to deprive our military of its ability to uh, use network systems, so many of our weapon systems now depend upon uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cyber connectivity, or if they decided to attack our infrastructure, uh, and that could be another country, or it, as I said a minute ago in my little joke about the dogs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it could also be terrorist groups, it could be uh, uh, activist groups of different sorts. Is this already underway? Would you say that, that the presumed or alleged uh, uh, event in which Israel is alleged to have actually gone after Iran and some of its nuclear capability through a cyber attack. Are we already seeing this era, and was that sort of the opening of it? Well, Stuxnet, even. I mean, well, I Stuxnet, is, it, which is often attributed in the press to the U.S. and Israel, um, was clearly a, uh, an act in which damage was done to physical objects, a thousand centrifuges in a, across a border in another country. Is that war or not? Uh, we would argue it's sabotage, not war. Um, but uh, and that you would reserve the word war for something that's more serious. But I suppose if you're an Iranian, it might look like war to you. And so we. But what's interesting is that we haven't seen that many such things. People will talk to the the uh, uh, denial of service attacks in. Uh, uh, Estonia or Georgia as examples of cyber war, it, it, it's a bit stretching. I mm -hmm, mean, you know, mm -hmm. somebody said it's better to think of, of them as cyber riots, that you're recruiting a lot of, of computers to uh, deluge another country's uh, computer systems. Uh, but 
that it's that as a full scale war, it's a bit that there is. Is that is the, the fact that we haven't seen them? Is that because the, the technological capabilities may be not there, the organization structures may not be there, or is it is it perhaps that we're still in preseason? The, the preparations are going. I mean, that's the nature of security in yeah. the 21st century. Is you don't actually know when the, the threat is. Oh, I is think embedded. it's. I think that, that things will get worse. Uh, uh, but I, th I, I and certainly the technological capabilities for. Uh, uh, denial of service attacks are there, and mm -hmm. denial of service attacks happen all the time, right, and right. there are measures that are taken against it. I guess my point was that I don't think a uh, uh, distributed denial of service attack uh, is really a war. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a riot, a disruption or something, but, uh, you know, I think war is too strong a term for it. On the question of could, could the infrastructure be uh, sabotaged in ways that could be damaging, well, Stuxnet shows that it's possible. Do you, know? do you feel like Stuxnet was um, sort of potentially opening Pandora's box, showing people the, the, the way, a playbook? Um, well, some people believe that uh, uh, it did allow others, uh, actors who we wouldn't have uh, less confidence in to, to uh, do things which they might not otherwise been able to do. I think the uh, uh, you know the question of uh, why don't uh, why haven't we seen more of it? Uh, it has something to do with technology. Um, it's also something like Stuxnet was uh, beyond the uh, aptitude of just the ordinary hacker. I mean, you, you required a, a a large amount of human intelligence by a large intelligence service, and. Uh, uh, a lot of preparation that went into it, which was beyond the the realm of uh, the sort of uh, the group of uh, kids who get together and say, "Let's go and stop the electricity someplace." Oh, so potentially state sponsored, but uh, so is that what we can expect going forward? Is that, that it's likely that you have to have the resources of a government behind you, or do you see potentially? I mean, look at Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> Started by, you know, mm -hmm. ostensibly a bunch of smart oh, no, guys. I, yeah. I, I mean, the point is that the directions of technology are making a lot of this easier. Um, and I think individuals can play roles. The other point is that if you think of um, criminal groups, uh, they uh, are pretty sophisticated technology. They can recruit a lot of money. One of the questions for the future is suppose that um, terrorist groups or activist groups that want to cause harm hire a criminal group or pay them for their, some of their innovations of technology. Um, and they want to, we, we've already seen some of this where you, you blackmail a company uh, by saying you're not going to be able to contact your, your customers for such and such a time or uh, you're, you know, if you want to get access to your computers, which we have now encrypted, uh, you have to pay this amount of money into this account somewhere in Kazakhstan or whatever. Um, so, I mean, that sort of thing is already happening. The question is, what happens if, if a, a future Al-Qaeda decides to, to buy that capacity from a, 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 a criminal group? And you can, you, know, you can do this on the, on the Internet. I think it was Fadi Shahadi this morning said, I'm kind of tired of playing defense. You know, and, I, and I took that to mean that the security has traditionally been, been, been very reactive. Uh, but my question is, is, is that really the case? I mean, it seems as though, for instance, the NSA with, with PRISM is being proactive. I mean, certainly reacting to 9-11, but taking proactive measures. Um, is the community being more proactive and, and going more on the, the offense that the average person doesn't see? Well, they, they, I think uh, NSA would probably say that uh, what it does in surveillance is defense, not offense. Uh, what's done by intelligence communities that may have been behind the uh, Stuxnet, that would be defined as mm -hmm. offense. I mean, it, if you are trying to find ways to anticipate an attack, whether it be a terrorist attack in the in the kinetic world, uh, or whether it be a, uh, a cyber attack on other systems in the uh, cyber world, uh, that type of surveillance, I think, it would be thought of as defense.
So Snowden has, has implied anyway that he's got more information that he could potentially leak. In, in, in your view, is, is that a viable bargaining chit? Should the U.S. You know, entertain such offers because of that potential threat, or in your view, no way? I don't know how much, I mean, I, I simply factually don't know how much is still left in Snowden's treasure trove. I mean, I think if there's a lot left in the in his treasure trove, uh, and we could get it back and be assured that it wasn't copied or mirrored in uh, uh, third systems, um, uh, I might, uh, just as a practical um, uh, bargaining point, listen. Uh, listen, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a big if. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, but frankly, it depends on the facts. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay, well, Joe, thanks very much. Really appreciate your perspectives and uh, the good work that you do in this community, and uh, appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. All right, keep it right thank there, everybody. We'll be right back. This is theCUBE. We're live at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right back. <laughs>